Hello everybody, Chris here, and in this video I want to show all of you the first release version of my grid building plugin for Godot 4. So the concept of this plugin is to allow you to target tiles on your 2D tile map in Godot, and then to select placeable objects, such as the smithy over here, and then place them onto the grid while checking for things like collision, or if the tiles are actually off the grid, like here. So if placement is valid, we can go ahead and place enter here, and you'll see that a copy of the object is placed into the game world. But for any of our tile collision indicators, that's these B squares you see hovering above the preview, if any of them conflict with a collision under them, like under here, as long as we're using the no collision rule, then we won't be able to place into them. So I can actually walk over this square. So you can see that you can have a layer set up to be a placement only layer, and then you can have another layer set up to be actual physical collisions. So with the smithy, the blue box we're seeing around the smithy, um, and this is with collision debug enabled, that's why we can see these. You can see that we can walk into these wall areas and we won't be able to go through them. But the blue square for the placement area we can walk through them even if we can't necessarily place into those squares. So if I try to place here, then obviously this new smithy is going to collide with the old one. So I made sure that the system is able to work with all of the standard 2D collision shapes. So if I place into here the pillar, I'll hit enter, and then I move the cursor so that we can see the actual collision under it. This is a capsule shape. So the collision tile indicators are added to any tile where we would detect inside of the preview scene that there is any collision whatsoever. So even if it's just a couple pixels here at the top or down here below, we'll still have a tile collision indicator to check to make sure that that tile is completely free for placement. And I think that just goes much better for this kind of grid style building to make sure that a tile is completely clear. So likewise, with this uh, test object, this is actually using collision polygon 2D. If I place it into the game world, we can see the shape here. Once again, if a tile does not have a collision, then it's not going to add a tile indicator. But for these tiles that have a collision halfway through them, of course, we still get the square tile collision indicator. So with different placeable objects, you're also able to customize which placement rules are set up for each object individually. So up here in the top left, you can see that I have this gold resources, and we've been spending those as we place objects into the scene. So if I go back to build and we try to place a few more smithies, you'll see each one is costing 200. And as soon as I run out of resources in the build log in the bottom left, we do not have enough resources. We're short 10 gold, so we can't place it into the game world. So to make sure that the system is flexible for different game genres, I made sure that you can just inherit from the building rule class if you want to write your own rules for how to validate placement into the game world. So something that must be true in order for the building system to successfully place an object into your scene. So here we have another scene from a project I'm working on uh, for a resource gatherer game. And you can see that there are pickups around the map. I can go ahead and gather those and I can swing a pickaxe over here and collect those. And then these resources will be displayed up here in the top left. So in order to build uh, the resources, I have the spend material resources rule added onto this farmhouse over here. So I can place this farmhouse into the game world. Left click. You'll see that that spends two wood and two rocks over here. I can do that a second time, but now I'm going to be out of resources. So if I come over here now and I try to place, we're going to get that error message. Building a farmhouse failed. Not enough materials. Rock two, brown wood two. And the messages that pop up in the build log template are just coming back as a signal um, that has basically each rule, how it succeeded or how it failed, and a message that goes along with it. And of course, you can choose whether to show those or hide those however you want in your own game. Um, this is just a quick demo of how it might look. So you can see I'm intentionally choosing to hide the success messages about building the farmhouses uh, because I don't really care about what the rules were internally as long as it's success because i don't really care about the rules internally as long as it's successfully placed that's not really information the player would necessarily need to know but they might want to know uh, which materials they don't have enough of for the full tutorial on the ins and outs of using the plugin i'll have that video coming up soon on my youtube channel and i will have the links in any page where i am posting this system 
So in the demo scene for the building system, we can see that I have the building system node and a grid targeting system node added as a child of my main gameplay scene. And then these systems are going to work by having a reference to your main tile map in your actual game level. So on the building system, if we look in the inspector, we can take a look at some of the settings. So one of the key features of the building system is the ability to set build rules. And build rules are something where I've provided a few default templates that, of course, are probably going to go in every game. But you also have the option of extending the base class build rule in order to add your own rules, which can be validated inside of the building system. So in always include rules here, I've set up in the demo the no collision rule. So I can expand that. You can just see that this is a resource file. So to add a new build rule, I would click here and choose one of the options from the list. So any class that extends building rule uh, will show up here and you can use that there. And then going right down below, we can see within tile map bounds rule. So when these are included in always include rules, that means whenever the building system places anything into your game, it's going to first check that there's no collisions which looks at the mask of your tile collision indicators and checks if under them there would be any conflicting collisions. And then within tile map bounds, it's going to make sure that each of those tile map collisions is actually hovering over a valid tile as indicated by a tile actually having tile data. So this tile, we can see a sprite drawn on top of it, is a valid tile because it has data. And then outside of here, the part of the tile map or off the tile map where no tiles have been uh, actually added in is considered an invalid tile. So it's outside of the game world in a sense. So in many game genres where you can actually place objects, you're also going to want to limit the placement of those objects by a resource mechanics. So being able to subtract resources from an inventory is a pretty standard rule you might want to add. So that would be the spend resources rule that I've set up. So if I search my project for placeable resource files, this is where we actually set up the data for determining how a object can be placed into the game world, but it's not the object itself. It contains a packed scene, which is the object that gets placed in. But if we uh, double click on one of these, like this uh, pillar placeable, you can see it has a set of data. It's a standard resource file. We have the packed scene. So this is going to be the actual object in the game world. Uh, we have placement rules here. So whenever you want to set up a rule that's custom to a specific placeable, such as making it spend a certain amount of different types of resources, you can use the spend materials rule. So if we expand down here, you can see that these take stacks of items. So the material being subtracted is material gold and the count is 10. So I've set up two versions of the rule. Uh, one which is the spend materials rule and the other is spend materials rule generic. So the generic doesn't actually reference the direct classes, but it will require uh, your inventory if you're using a custom inventory to have certain methods implemented. But if you use the spend materials rule, which is my preferred option, and you have your items inherit from, if we have over here, base item, uh, then it becomes easier to actually select certain items from your game. So any class that extends base item, if we go to quick load, you'll see that those exact materials will show up here rather than every resource inside of your game. So I definitely think limiting the options you can set here directly to specific classes makes it just a lot easier to filter these menus. And that's why I prefer the non-generic version. So given that those need non-generic versions, I've provided some classes that you can use as the base of an inventory, or you could just use it purely for the material side of your inventory and then have other classes for managing other items. Base item.gd, base item stack.gd, and item container.gd. So item container.gd, you can define which types of tags can actually go into the item container. So an item container can be limited in which types of items can go inside. A base item and a base item stacks just simply have the requirements for uh, what an item would need to be to interact with the spend materials rule. So pretty basic here, having a display name, a texture, and I gave it a set of tags which can, you can help uh, identify which item fits which categories. So these are uh, resources that you assign on an array to the tags and then a maximum stack size here as well. So the stack size comes in handy when you're dealing with the item stacks. So we take a base item and give it a count. So that's needed uh, so that you can uh, basically set how many of an item you want to remove when you spend the resources or when you want to add items to the item container. 
Uh, so I'll go over that a lot more in the actual tutorial. Okay, so along with the base building system, I've also provided the demo of course, which includes uh, several UI components, which you could use as templates for actually building out the UI of your game. So that would be stuff like the build log, displaying the messages whenever a building is successful or fails. The placement selection menu, you can add placeables to this and have them display so that you can select them to place into your grid. And then up here in the top left, a resource display. So showing the resources that are available inside of your player's inventory in a graphical GUI up there. And I'm going to have uh, the building system up on at least three different places to start. So itch.io for the normal store page. And then on Ko-Fi and Patreon as well, supporters of my channel will be able to uh, download the system for themselves to use and try out and add to your own games. So that pretty much in a nutshell is the rundown of how you can use the building system for targeting your grid and placing objects into your game world while the game's actually running. Once again, check out the tutorial playlist, which I'm going to go into full detail on how all of this works and how you can set it up for yourself to use in your own games as well. And you can keep track of future updates to the grid building system on itch.io for written devlogs and on my YouTube channel for video content as well. So that's going to be it for this video. I've been Chris. Hope you guys enjoyed a look at the first version of the grid building system. Thanks for watching to the end, and I will see all of you in my future video content.